Hello and welcome. Um, this is the special director's commentary for my talk. Uh, the reason being that when I tried to record the talk earlier, I put the iPod in my pocket and that um, pressed the stop button on the recording. So my name is Matt Gray. I work at the Australian National University. Uh, my job title is a research programmer, which means that um, the academics come up with all of the the good ideas and I'm the uh, poor person who has to implement them in code. I also work with the ANU marketing office doing web stuff on the ANU website and a bit of iOS development. Um, we did an iOS app for our university open day this year so I was the one coding on that. Today we'll be talking about CSS effects um, this is a talk that I've based on something I saw at WWDC this year. There'll be a little bit of content that is the same. Um, hopefully some stuff in there that's new for people who've already seen the, the WWDC talk. And we'll be looking at transforms, 3D sort of stuff, all sorts of gradients and transitions, and animations. Um, also a bit of stuff about how to handle other browsers. Now we won't be talking about WebGL, which is um, putting OpenGL kind of code into a browser. And we won't be talking about SVG, which is a way to use uh, scalable vector graphics in your web browser. So what we're going to do here is um, have a look at a short snippet from the WWDC talk. Um, I think this will be cut out of the internet version, so um, if you're watching this from home via the magic of the internet, um, you can spend the next three or four minutes just thinking how awesome it would have been to be in the audience. All right, um, so we're back live. Um, now, if you haven't seen the WWDC talk, um, I recommend that you watch maybe the first 10 minutes at least, just so that you've got some idea what we're trying to achieve here in this talk today. Um, so the first thing that we want to do is make a, a box that we can transform in 3D space in our web browser. Um, so the next bit of code is basically as hard as the HTML coding is going to get in this talk. And it's coming any minute now, there it is. So what we've got here is a div and inside it we've got five empty divs. And that's all we have to do. Um, now the real work is going to come in the CSS file. I have no idea what I was spending all my time talking about here. There it is. Um, so what we've done here is we're using the nth child um, selector in CSS. Um, you may not have seen this before. This basically lets you pick out a particular div that's a child of another CS, uh, another DOM element. Um, and what we're going to do is translate that on the z-axis. Now that means it will move towards the screen, or sort of towards the user, like we see there. And we're doing that for one of our divs. Uh, for the second child div, first of all we're going to rotate it and then we're going to translate it. So you can see how we're building up the box here. Um, for each of those five divs, we're doing some sort of trans, uh, rotation perhaps, and a translate, and that means that we can build up a, uh, a three-dimensional cube. Now to make this all work in the browser, um, there are a few things that we need to put into our CSS. The first one is preserve 3D. Uh, this means that Anything that is a child of the package div will share the same 3D space. Uh, there's another argument to that, which is flat, which means that everything will be just painted on and you lose that 3D effect. The other thing that we need to do is give it a perspective value. Here I've put in 800 pixels. In a minute we'll see that um, this is just a value you can play around with. Um, there's no really, there's no right answer here. Basically you have to 
size your divs, then play around with the perspective to see how it looks. So just with um, those few things in our CSS, um, some rotations, uh, setting up the 3D and putting in the perspective, we can get our divs to translate and make this um, sort of this uh, the rendering of the, the 3D box. So how much perspective should we give it? Um, as I was saying, we just need to play around with some numbers. Anything between, say, 800 to 1200 seemed okay for my demos. Uh, too low, and you get that really weird sort of fisheye look. Too high, and it looks like it's just flat, and you, you lose the 3D effect. So let's look at rotating the box. The first thing we can do is um, tell WebKit how long we want the transforms to take. So you can see in bold there I've um, said anytime I want to do something I want it to take one second. Um, I've also set up some classes here. These are quick references to um, points on the cube that I want to show. So um, I've got a class there for inside the cube and what I'm doing is rotating on the x-axis by 90 degrees. So that will move the whole package, which is the whole five uh, divs, and it'll spin the whole cube to look inside the box. So we've got one there for left, back and right. And when we actually want to do the, uh, the rotating of the box, um, we can use some JavaScript. Um, I've got a button here that we uh, give an argument to and that's simply just pushing that argument into the uh, the class of the package which is that um, div that contains all of our sides of our boxes and so what we're going to do here is have a look at a quick little demo and this will show us um, a few buttons that we can click on just to move our box around So here you can see, um, it looks a little bit um, shaky in the recording. If um, you're looking at this in your browser, it would be really nicely rendered and it looks fine. I think there was a question from the audience here about what happens if you click on, say, the left and then the right. Um, the answer is that it knows where you are. Um, if you click really quickly like that, it sort of, it fills in the blanks. You don't have to worry about it. Um, and, you know, we can just get on with our, our, our web programming. We don't have to worry about the, um, the ins and outs of the 3D stuff here. We just tell it where we want it to be. It knows where it is and it fills in the, the stuff in the middle. Um, it also has some nice sort of easing functions built in. Um, they seem to be on by default. So you can see that when you first um, start rotating, um, it'll start slow and then it'll speed up and then it'll slow down again at the end. I don't know how to turn that off if you want to. Um, that was a question at the time. So let's um, look at making our, our wireframe box a little bit prettier. Um, what we can do is simply just put a say a PNG or a JPEG on as the background image for the div. But we can go a little bit further than that. We can add a radial gradient to the background. Now you can add um, as many of the, as these gradient things as you like um, and you can have them with a PNG or a JPEG. And what this, um, this radial gradient is doing is it's fading in a sort of a circular shape from the middle of the div. It's starting out as transparent and it's moving towards a, um, a semi-transparent black color. So it sort of gives the effect of um, some lighting 
it's not real lighting, it's not like OpenGL uh, lighting. But it gives the, um, the hint of some lighting and it's pretty cheap and easy for us to do. So if you want to know more about gradients, um, have a look at the WebKit blog. Um, and here's an example of um, the kind of thing that you can do. You can give it a start position from the top and left of the div. You can give it a shape, which is circular or a circle or ellipse. You can give it a size, which can be an absolute size, or it can be something like um, closest corner, which means it will work out where it is in the div, work out the distance to the corner that's closest to the center of that um, gradient, and then that becomes the size of the gradient. And you can chain together as many colors as you like. Uh, if you're looking at sample code, you might find something called WebKit Gradient. That's been replaced um, maybe six months ago with the two different types, which are WebKit Linear Gradient and WebKit Radial Gradient. So you want to adjust any sample code that you find. Um, the old uh, WebKit Gradient still works, but um, you know it's best to be using what they're pushing at the moment. So here we have our box and we have added on a PNG file and we've also added on a gradient. So it looks, um, you know, it looks nice with a minimum of effort on our part. Now all the, uh, the code that I'm demoing here I'll be making available. So you can um, load these up in your browser and have a look and a play and see how I've, I've um, coded this all up. So next we are going to look at the box lids. Um, these were a little bit problematic. All the transforms take place around the center of the div that you're transforming. But we want to rotate the box lid about its bottom edge. So the way that um, I've gotten around this is to use a mask on the, the div itself. And what that means is that um, we only show the top half of the div. The bottom half is invisible. And that means that when we're rotating about the center of the div, it looks like we're actually rotating about the bottom edge of the div. So how do we uh, apply a mask? We use WebKit mask image. Um, and what we can do is pass in something like a PNG, which has transparency in it. Anything that's black will be shown in the div. Anything that's transparent will be made invisible. Um, anything in between will be sort of faded, faded out. Um, you can also use an SVG, which will give you a nice sort of clean, crisp um, mask, no matter what size you make your div. And what I've done here is actually put in a linear gradient as the thing that we're going to use to mask. So the gradient starts at the top and it's black for half of the div, which means that half will be shown. And it's transparent for the other half, which means that half becomes invisible. Another thing to, um, to notice when you're doing these sorts of transforms in your um, HTML if your um, transform surface ends up off the original plane, which is basically where you start when you're just loading all your divs in in a, a flat sort of screen, um, then any text and images will end up being sort of, uh, scaled and they'll look a bit distorted. So the solution that I found was to transform all the objects back to the original plane after you've done all of your other transforms. So in the first examples I was showing that it's pretty simple to just move the uh, the front of your box out by 200 pixels, do all your rotations and so on and your cube spins around. Um, what I'm doing now is on the package which is the whole of the box um, we're going to move it back 200 pixels which means it ends up on the original plane. Uh, when we want to do something like rotate to the right, si the right size, um, 
We do the rotation, then we do a translate so that that right side ends up on the original plane. So on for the left side and the back and the inside. That just means that any text that you've put on the um, on any divs that are on those cube surfaces, they um, they look nice and crisp. So let's have a look at making the oval labels that you may have noticed in the uh, the WWDC talk. Um, the first way I tried to do it was using a radial gradient. So this is an elliptical gradient, um, and what I've done is had a color out to a certain spot, then transparent, then the color, then transparent. It looks um, a bit dodgy. Um, that's because there doesn't seem to be any nice anti-aliasing on those um, gradients. Um, second attempt, I just used the, the border radius on the divs, and that actually looks a lot nicer. So I think the lesson here is to um, experiment with what you've got. Um, there's usually more than one way to do these sorts of things in CSS and sometimes uh, the results will be a lot better um, with one way rather than the other. So next we are having a look at making the ribbon. Um, this stuff is actually covered in the the WWDC talk in quite a lot of detail, so I won't be um, spending a lot of time on this. But what we've, what we've got here is actually two different gradients and they're both applied to the div, which is just a, um, a rectangle. The first gradient um, is fading from the left to the right. It's starting out at um, quite a dark red and then it's going up to a lighter red after 10 pixels and then it's fading out into normal red after, over the next 50 pixels. So that gives that sort of um, curved effect on the left of the div. The other one is just a uh, another linear gradient. This one we've actually given it a, a degree value which means that we get that um, triangular sort of thing on the end. And then they get added together and um, you get the label. Uh, making the envelope, we're using a linear gradient to fade from a white to a grey, and we're also putting in a box shadow. Um, box shadows are awesome, you should put them on absolutely everything because um, they look really cool. <laughs> um, the envelope inputs were next, and what I'm doing here is using the label thing in HTML. Um, if you're not using label for your HTML forms, you probably should look at doing that. Uh, it makes your forms a lot more accessible and it also makes them really easy to style. So here I'm just giving the labels a width and some padding on the right and floating them left, text to line right. That means that everything lines up really nicely in your form. Next for the inputs, um, we're putting, we're replacing the standard sort of box around the input we're just putting in a single line along the bottom and when we get the uh, the text focus on an input we're changing that to have a box. We're putting in the border radius just to make it a little bit nicer around the edges, changing the background colour and the important thing here is we're putting in outline none. Now outline none means that it turns off um, the thing that Safari does with any inputs when you click on them it puts that red um, border around them. Uh, there's no point trying to style your form if you've got these blue things that sort of override everything. So putting outline none is what to do there. Um, next, you may have noticed um, on some of the, the boxes in that demo that they have that nice inset sort of thing. It looks like um, that um, they've got like a cutout in the box with the information in it. So what, we've, what I've done here is um, applied a, a white div and I've made it mostly transparent. That just changes the colour slightly. Um, we're also putting in two different linear gradients. One at the top which is basically just a, um, a dark grey fade to transparent and another one on the right. Um, you could probably put one on the left and the bottom as well if you wanted to. Um, the 
repeating gradients on the stripes. Here we're using things like border radius on the div, again to give it that nice little curve on the edge. And we're putting in a repeating linear gradient this time. So this is similar to the linear gradient, except that um, rather than stretching the gradient over the whole width of the div, it, um, you give it absolute values. And when it gets to the end of that, it will go back to the start of that color loop. So here we're starting with a light blue, going to dark blue, and then it fades back, it goes back to the light blue and keeps repeating. Um, so next, a CSS tick. You may have seen in the WWDC demo that they mentioned this specifically, but then didn't show how to do it. Um, so here's my attempt at it. Um, we're putting in a linear gradient, giving it a degree value to make it go on an angle. And then we're doing another one, same sort of thing, different angle, different size. And we're putting that second one inside the first div. And then in the HTML, we put in a div with another div inside it, give it that class, and we end up with a tick. So keep in mind that that just took two slides worth of CSS and a bit of HTML, but if you had have just put in this one Unicode character in HTML, you get a much nicer tick. So this raises our, an important point that when you're doing all this uh, CSS things, um, you can kind of overdo it. Now I know in the Apple demo they were trying to do everything in CSS just to show it could be done. Um, but just remember putting in all of this stuff um, sometimes it doesn't really make your website better. And there we go, gratuitous transition. All right, so <laughs> now that I've said um, don't put in too much stuff, um, here's some more stuff. Um, the stickers, which had the, the nice little hover on them, um, what we've got here is telling WebKit that when we do a transition we only want to affect the bottom left radius of the border and the box shadow. And when we hover over it we want to change the bottom left radius to have that curve and we're putting in a box shadow. We're offsetting it slightly to the left so that the shadow seems to be on the left side of the sticker which is giving the effect that it's been peeled up. So when we click on the sticker, um, we want to do a, an animation. So the clicking calls some JavaScript. That simply changes the style, um, WebKit animation. And that's calling a CSS pseudo function called stamp it. It's going to take two seconds and it's going to go forwards. Now the, uh, the forwards value, you can have backwards, you can have um, I think there's a value to make it go forwards and back and keep repeating. Uh, there's an increment, which means it goes forwards and then goes back to the start and keeps continuing on. So have a look at the, uh, the documentation for that if you're interested in doing this sort of stuff. So here's our pseudo function called stamp at one. This is going to take the first stamp and do some things to it. Um, at the 0% time, that's basically where we start. Um, we, don't have to do, we don't have to type that in. It just works out where we want to be at a particular time and it works out all the values in between. So after 25% of the time, um, it's, it's translated a bit, it's rotated and done sort of various things. After 50%, we've translated it some more and we've scaled it by two, which makes it look a lot bigger. So it really seems to pop out at the user. And after 100%, we've um, given it some absolute values on the screen. And so that means that um, WebKit works out that, you know, after 100%, you need to be there. So it sort of moves it across the whole transition. So it will end up in the right spot. So here are some more animations that we can do. Um, this one is going to be infinite, infinite, which means it'll, once it gets to the 100% value, it'll jump back to the zero and keep going. And this one we're putting in a timing function of 10 steps. 
So this means that rather than doing a nice um, fluid transition between all of the values, um, it's going to divide it up into 10 steps and there'll be discrete steps. The animation will jump from one to the other. Now this is how we're going to do the, the cat paws going around in a circle. So you can see we've got two um, pseudo functions here. One is just starting at zero, ending at 360. Um, and because it's um, been set to infinite, once it gets to the end, it'll go back to the start. This thing will just keep going round and round. The second one we've offset by 18 degrees. Um, that means that the pause will get the sort of um, one after the other effect that we want. We're using 18 de degrees because there was 10 steps, which means it's 36 degrees per step, and so we want to have it halfway. Um, so here we've got the divs that we've um, actually used, and I've left the borders on just to show how they work. Um, we're putting the divs on the same sort of central point with some absolute positioning. And because the transitions happen about the center of these divs, they're both going to spin on the same point. Then what I've done is put the, the paws in as a background image of those divs, put it in as center top, and set it to non-repeating. And that way it makes the, um, the pause just go around in the circle, basically on the radius of that circle, because they're on the, the top of that div, on each of their divs. Um, now I've given this demo before and I had one person horrified because they thought, you know, what kind of sickos work at Apple who go around chopping off the front paws of cats um, just so that they can have two paws to go around in a circle. Um, so just to show it can be done, here's a four-pawed cat. And that was easier to do, um, basically just copy and paste the divs that we've already got and offset them by a number of degrees again. So, uh, yet another demo. This one we're going to look at putting together some of these uh, things that we've just been through. So here's a shipping label. Um, obviously not exactly the same as the Apple demo. Uh, they didn't release their demo code, so everything that I've shown here today I've just had to make up from scratch. So you can see that when we click on the, the uh, text inputs, we get the nice border around. It changes this, the color. Uh, when we rotate, you'll see that the envelope pops in and out. We're doing that with a, a scale transition. And we're setting up the WebKit timing so that um, it, it's slightly quicker to pop into the box as we're rotating. So it gives the effect that the envelope goes into the box before we've finished rotating. Um, when we come back the other way, um, I've set it up to take slightly longer, so it gives the effect that um, the envelope is still coming out of the screen off the box once you um, hit that side. Here we have our hover transitions for the stamps, so the, you get the nice little curl effect there, and clicking on the stamp um, gives you the keyframe animation that zooms it across to the side. Here's our kitty cats. Um, now this didn't work quite as well as I would have hoped. Um, the timing is way out and I think the reason is that in actually recording this demo that was using up a lot of the CPU on my <laughs> rather old laptop. Um, so yeah, it didn't quite sync up properly. Have a look at the demo yourself and it should work a lot better. Now this is what it looks like on the inside of the box. Um, I've just stuck all these divs straight on the side of each of these box things. You can still actually interact with some of these things. You can click on the stamps on the inside and they'll still fly across to the right spot. If you wanted them to not appear on the inside, um, there's a few things you could do. And we'll talk about that in a little while. So here's a few more demos that I put together. Um, this one is an ad adaptation of those cat paws that were spinning around. Just putting in some different images to um, give different hands on a clock. So 
So we have another clock here. Um, some JavaScript so that if I type in a time and click set, it will move the hands and it will do them in a nice way. It'll just transition, do the nice transition so that they spin around and do the nice easing functions. Um, and the next one is my version of the old uh, animated GIF that you used to get on websites for doing page counters. So here we have some CSS, this is all just done in CSS and uh, the WebKit timing stuff. So now if we look on the inside of this box, you can see how that's been built. Um, 10 different divs, they're all sort of rotated around each other. And then we re just repeat and repeat and repeat to make new spinners. Um, so if we wanted to hide this stuff on the inside of the box, what we can do is move those divs out by a couple of pixels in the z-axis. That will mean that they won't be seen through the side of the box. Um, there's also a, a backing function, I think, it WebKit backing or something like that. Um, I had to play with that and couldn't get it to work. Theoretically, that should be a way of stopping you from seeing the back of um, something, so it won't get rendered from the back, but it will from the front. Um, so yeah, have a play with that if, um, if you're interested in putting something like this together. So let's move on to some mouse interaction now. Um, with JavaScript, we can query the mouse. Um, we can also query the current transformation matrix and we can do some modification. So what I've got here is a, a range thing in input um, on a form. And what we're doing is whenever we change the slider, we're going to call some JavaScript. Um, what we can also do is have a, a mouse down or mouse up or mouse move function on our package, which is the whole, the whole box. So what we can do here is um, put in a little bit of JavaScript. Whenever we see that slider change, we're going to change the WebKit transform on one of our elements. Um, now the bad thing about this is that we've had to hard code in the translate Z, translate Y, and then just to change the X rotation. Um, so that means that we've stored our, basically our model data in JavaScript and in CSS, so that's a bad thing. So what we can do instead is get um, some, use some JavaScript to get the WebKit CSS matrix. Now that will give us the current transform values and we can then apply something that's relative to that matrix. Um, so all the things that you've seen up to date have been an absolute value. Um, this is the way that you do it if you want to do a, um, a relative transform. So there we get the current matrix and we, tr and we rotate it by a certain amount. Um, that means we don't have to hard code in all the other transforms that we've had to do to get to that certain point. So here we have our box again, and I've set up some mouse move functions, and we can just spin our box around using the mouse. And I've got a, a form slider there that moves the, uh, the rotation on the box lid. Um, what you may notice is that the box lids are actually too small for the box, so the kitty cats will escape out the top of the box. And there's a reason for that. I made the box lids the right size, um, but then when you were looking at the box, they actually looked really, really weird. Um, so sometimes we have to just throw away the uh, reality of the thing and make it sort of approximate reality, um, just to make it look better in the browser. So that was mouse interaction. Right, um, so getting near the end, what have we seen today? We've seen lots and lots of things that have dash WebKit in front of them. Um, the only one there that doesn't is Box Shadow. Um, so keep that in mind um, because we're now going to talk about what happens with other browsers. Very soon. No, we're not. We're going to talk about this. Excellent. So, here's a little demo that I put together, um, thinking what else could we do that's kitty cat related. Um, so obviously, we can have cheeseburger. 
So applying some of the things that we've learnt today, we're using some border radiuses, we're using linear gradients, um, for a little bit of melted cheese there we're using a rotation by 45 degrees and a mask to cut off the top of that um, box and then that leaves us with a little triangle. So here's the demo I've put together. Um, this is our box. I've just changed the the uh, gradients on the side of um, these so that we start with a nice sort of light grey and then we go to a blue. Um, we've got a slider to make the box bigger. You can see on the top here that um, I've got a WebKit animation. This is um, animating the linear gradient which I put across and what it's doing is actually changing the the background offset of the linear gradient that moves it sort of up the screen, gives it the illusion that it's actually rippling on the top of the water. So I can put in some cheeseburger fishies and we can click the I can has cheeseburger button and see happy cat jump in the tank and try and chase a cheeseburger. Looks a little bit jerky on the recording. Um, if you're looking at this in your browser then it's actually quite fine. I did a little bit of playing around. I had something like 50 cheeseburgers jumping around in the tank and um, Safari or WebKit were only using up like 2 or 3% of the CPU. Um, adding in the rippling water effect on the top uses up something like another 40% of the CPU so who knows what's going on there. Um, some of these things have been optimized and some of them haven't. Um, yeah, so if you're doing this sort of um, fancy effect, you probably want to do some sort of profiling just to make sure it's not going to end up with a, uh, a poor user experience for your, your web browser users. I'm sure you'll catch one one day. Obviously someone asked a question here and I answered it. Sorry about this. Hey, here we go. All right, now, so moving on to other browsers. Um, sorry to say, it's um, not good. Because these are all WebKit specific things, they're only going to work in WebKit browsers. So that means Safari, uh, Chrome, and iOS, and the built-in browser on Android. So that's not bad, but it doesn't include Firefox and IE. Um, the only one there that's not WebKit specific is Box Shadow. Um, but in some versions of Firefox it has different arguments to, I think, yeah, or border radius. One of those two, you've got to be really careful because they're actually different in Firefox to the, the standard one. And they're working in IE9, the border radius and box shadow type stuff. So what we are going to do in our code is check for um, WebKit. Now we're not going to just look at the browser string, um, what we're going to do is look at specific features. Now this means that further down the track if somebody actually introduces this feature then our code will start working on that browser. Um, it also means if feature goes away then our code will stop working on WebKit so that's a good thing because then it, will, it can fall back to some basic code that will still work. Then in our HTML um, we're going to load up, first of all load up the CSS for all browsers. Then we're going to use our JavaScript um, to call that function to check for WebKit animation. If we find it then we can write in this extra little bit of CSS um, link uh, thing here. And you'll notice that I've used document right there. Um, that's basically a no-no these days. Um, so a better way to do it is to get the DOM and create a new element and insert that as a new child of the head. So 
So the last thing that um, I think we looked at was this uh, Firefox demo. So here we have a, uh, another demo and this time we've got the buttons on there. We can click to continue, click to do our animation and then spin and so on. And the reason I look like a Gumby here is because um, I was doing this over my shoulder, so it's really hard to navigate. Um, so here's Firefox. Obviously we're, we don't have our rendered box anymore because there were no gradients, things like that. We could have whacked up a PNG behind perhaps, um, I didn't bother. Clicking continue, uh, oh, okay, the, uh, the forms still work. We get our nice little border radius around there. Clicking continue um, brings up the next side of the cube without a transition. The hover things work, but there's no one second delay, um, you may have noticed, so it was just immediate um, popping out rather than a nice sort of easing out. So that was Firefox. Um, if we have a look at Chrome, um, Chrome is based on web, uh, the WebKit stuff underneath. So it's going to have all of that um, nifty WebKit stuff built in. So Chrome should work just the same as Safari. So the, yeah, there you go, you get the, um, the nice cube, spins around and so on. Actually it looks a little bit rougher on the edges now that I'm looking at it again. Maybe they're doing a bit more anti-aliasing in Safari or something. Yeah, don't know. Um, and I think as a last little bit of fun, we had a look at Opera. So here we go, Opera looks pretty much the same as Firefox. Um, same thing with the hovers, they happen immediately rather than easing in, uh, easing in and out over one second. Right, so that was the, uh, the end of the talk. Um, thank you for watching, and there's my details if you wanted to ask me any questions about this. Um, I will be putting up the, the demo code on the AUC website, and um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the, the talk, and I hope you go away and make some beautiful websites. Thank you. <laughs>